Hello! We are going to be uh, viewing the slideshow for, chap for uh, World War II on this lecture. Uh, World War II officially ran from 1939 to 1945, and uh, we really need to go all the way back to World War I to really understand why World War II happened. So, um, first let's talk about what happened at the end of World War I. We had an organization called the League of Nations was formed, and it was in, supposed to prevent any other great big wars like we had seen with World War I. And uh, as you can see from this cartoon over here, it was generally considered a dismal failure because it lacked any real power. And we also have to talk about Adolf Hitler, who was really, you could say, the star of World War II. He was born in Austria in 1889, fought and injured in World War I, was generally considered to be a good soldier, not a um, superstar, but certainly not a coward. He, um, after World War I, he attempted to uh, move into uh, art school, but that didn't work out for him. So instead, he got involved in politics, and he became... Um, part of a attempted coup in 1923 when he tried to overthrow the German government. It was called the Beer Hall Push um, because that's where it was actually planned in a beer hall. Um, he was angry that Germany capitulated to the demands of the League of Nations. He was sentenced to five years in jail and he only served one because eventually he was pardoned by the Bavarian Supreme Court. But while he was in jail, he used his time to write his manifesto, Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf in English means my struggle. In Mein Kampf, he outlines his plan to rebuild Germany to its former glory. Um, he calls his party um, the Nazis, or Nazi, uh, National Socialism. He had a strong sense of nationalism. He believed that the Aryans were the only true Germans. Now, who are the Aryans? Um, Aryans were of Northern European descent. Generally, you see blonde, blue-eyed, very pale, fair-skinned people. According to Hitler, he believed that Aryans were the master race that populated the lost island of Atlantis 10,000 years ago. Which, by the way, there is absolutely no support for that. Um, he also promoted the idea of anti-Semitism, which is um, being anti-Jewish. He pushed the idea of reclaiming land to the east towards Russia. He was very much against communism. And last but not least, he endorsed the idea of using slave labor, um, specifically the Slavic people, to help rebuild Germany. And if you remember, it was the Slavs who were the uh, the bone between Germany and Austria versus Russia and England in World War I. So, <clears throat> how does this guy become so powerful? Well, after his book is published, he works with a political party called NSDAP, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And that is, in and of itself, the Nazi Party. Um, in 1925, he renounces his Austrian citizenship, which is very important. And right before he runs for president in 1932, he becomes a German citizen. What was he doing from 1925 to 1932? He was working his way through the party. You know, with a political party, you start at the bottom and you have to work your way through. Um, why did he become so well-known and powerful in seven years? he was a great speaker. He was the kind of speaker that people would leave their houses to come see. And because of that, his message of being so unhappy with the German government, with the League of Nations, with the uh, Treaty of Versailles, was very, very appealing to people. Now, in 1932, when he did run for president, he lost. However, he received 35% of the vote, demonstrating that he appealed to a large segment of the German public. 
Um, consequently, the new president, and that's President Hindenburg, felt pressure to give Hitler a position in the government. So he named him Chancellor of Germany, kind of like a vice president or prime minister, but, um, you know, it was clearly Hindenburg was supposed to be in charge. Now, just a couple of pictures I wanted to show you. Here is Hitler, head bowed, shaking hands with the very large President Hindenburg. But in the news, what you're seeing is Hindenburg is actually being um, used by Hitler to sit as a seat and to carry him forward. Um, pretty much any politically savvy people understood at that point that Hitler was on the rise while Hindenburg was not that um, important. Now, Hitler was a great speaker, but he was also a great manipulator. As chancellor, Hitler was able to prevent a clear majority from forming in the Reichstag, which is the German Congress. He convinced President Hindenburg to dissolve the Reichstag and call for new elections because they were at an impasse. Nothing was getting done. In the meantime, Hitler had one of his men set fire to the Reichstag building, and here it is on fire, and here it is afterwards. When it was investigated, the police found evidence incriminating the communists, conveniently placed there by Hitler's arsonist. Now, how does this benefit Hitler? How does this benefit um, the Nazis? Well, a week later is the election of March of 1933. The election occurs and the communists were roundly defeated with their votes going to the NSDAP, otherwise known as the Nazi Party. And this was really Hitler's first step, first real manipulation towards taking over Germany. And then it goes very quickly. By July 1933, the Nazi Party was the only legal party in Germany. In August 1934, President Hindenburg dies. The cabinet appoints Hitler as Führer, and that is both president and chancellor in one position. And at this point, August 1934, Hitler is the dictator of Germany. Now, once Hitler has established himself as the head of Germany, he is going to start pushing boundaries. In 1935, Hitler started to increase the size of the German military, which was expressly forbid by the Treaty of Versailles. He also set up military bases on their western border with France in direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. The League of Nations, yeah, they gave him a stern warning. As you can see here, the League of Nations was seen as a cute little bunny, and oh look, international strife is about to eat him up. Essentially, the League of Nations had no teeth, and it was becoming very clear that Hitler was all teeth. Hitler also makes some friends. <clears throat> In the same year, 1935, Hitler and the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini formed an alliance. Mussolini was committed to invading parts of Africa and taking over land there. Um, fascism if you think about how the Spartans acted back in ancient Greece, is pretty much the same. It's that military might is the most important thing, power is the most important thing, strength, any sign of weakness is bad, so you get the picture. In 1936, Hitler and Japan agree to work together to fight communism. So, you know, this irony is that the communists who the United States ends up fighting for 50 years, were actually the good guys in World War II. Sort of. In 1937, it was clear that the Treaty of Versailles was not worth the paper it's written on. And at that point, you know, pretty much everybody understood that the Treaty of Versailles was a terrible failure. 1938. Hitler gives Austria an ultimatum. Become part of the German Empire or be invaded and be made part of the German Empire. Um, and just to kind of put this in context, here's Germany, here's Austria, and essentially it was, hey, join us the easy way or join us the hard way. Either way, you're going to join us. Um, that same year, Hitler demanded a part of Czechoslovakia, which was primarily populated by Germans. And again, Czechoslovakia is right here. 
So what we're seeing is Germany is beginning to consolidate the countries that are around it and begin to take them over. At the Munich conference, England, France, and Italy agreed to his demands. This is called the policy of appeasement because Hitler had promised he would make no more demands. And again, look at this picture of the time at the time, you know, Hitler's Germany is seen as a hungry wolf. Um, Hitler believed he was infallible and the rest of the countries were fools. And essentially, he was right to a certain extent. Um, the, cha the Prime Minister of England, Chamberlain, after this Munich conference, he gave a press conference and he said he has brought peace to our times. And obviously that couldn't be more wrong. In 1939, Hitler makes his next move. He signs a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. A month later, Hitler invades Poland with the Blitzkrieg technique. And that Blitzkrieg is the German word for well, lightning war. <clears throat> um, the technique is to break through territorial lines with tanks supported by airplanes and then follow up with infantry units to hold the newly conquered territory. So in World War I, when tanks were first invented, they used to put the foot soldiers first because they had to clear the debris so that the tanks wouldn't get stuck. Then they would have the tanks coming through. Well, Hitler reversed this. And so if you're a soldier guarding the border, and there's these giant tanks coming after you, and if you run, the planes are going to get you, you pretty much surrender right then and there. Germany then splits Poland with the Soviet Union. And here is a um, cartoon from the era, and here you see this is Stalin. He was the head of the Soviet Union. Notice his fingers are crossed. Here is Hitler. His hand is held behind his back, and they are standing on a map where they each have a foot in Poland. So World War II officially starts September 1st, 1939, when Germany invades Poland. September 3rd, France and Great Britain declare war on Germany. September 17th, the Soviet Union takes over Eastern Poland. So in a matter of less than three weeks, Germany positions itself as an invading country. The Soviet Union is complicit with the Germans by taking over Poland, and things get quiet for a while. And then the spring comes, and Germany invades Denmark and Norway. So Norway's up here, Denmark is here. But that's just the beginning. In quick succession, and this is all in the spring of 1940, he takes over Belgium, which is right here, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, which is a very, very small country, um, kind of like around here, um, Greece, down here, Yugoslavia, all of these countries down here, and then the jewel in the crown, France. He takes France in a matter of weeks and they surrender to Germany in 1940. So in a sense what you're seeing is he now has a lot of this particular area. So he has managed to get himself into a wonderfully um, reminiscent sect of what we saw the Charlemagne Empire own. 1940. It's all about Germany and Great Britain. And most of these battles were air battles. And this was in the summer of 1940. Meanwhile, Mussolini and the Italians were busy taking over North Africa. Great Britain was fighting there too. Germans sent some troops to help, but Hitler was not concerned about Afri uh, Africa. Now, keeping in mind that England is a small country, it is fighting two major fronts against the Germans and against the Italians, and has anyone really come to their assistance? No. Hitler 
makes the first wrong move, which is souring on the Soviets. He begins to think that he should take over the Soviet Union, even though he has a non-aggression pact with them. He believed that the German army was superior and believed that they could be successful very quickly. In 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union. The Soviet soldiers and the Russian weather proved to be much more challenging than Hitler had imagined. You're talking about an extremely large country. Um, Russia today is the largest single country in the world in terms of landmass. It's also very cold, lots of snow, and when you are um, fighting in those kind of temperatures, it is a much different context than fighting in regular weather. So we're going to just briefly talk about Japan and China in terms of why they get involved. Japan had invaded China in 1931 and was working its way through the country. Japan wanted to control all of China and then invade Soviet Siberia so they could consolidate their power in the east. When Japan in occupied Indochina in 1941, the USA responded by cutting off sales of iron and oil to Japan, officially condemning Japan's actions. So it took 10 years for the USA to get mad, but what <clears throat> the history books have hence revealed is that the United States was fighting a secret war in, J in China for many years before this officially became um, known. Um, because they had their own concerns about maintaining Chinese um, loyalty. So now that the United States had officially condemned Japan, Japan responds by bombing Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The USA declares war on Japan. Germany declares war on USA because of their pact with Japan. So really, a world war comes about because of all the different treaties and pacts that each of these countries had set up. And these are pictures of the actual bombing of Pearl Harbor. 1942, when the Americans enter the war, the tide begins to turn against the Germans. Um, the Germans are exhausted. They've been fighting for three years. The Americans, much like in World War I, come in three years after the war has been going on. They're strong. They're ready. They are aggressive. They um, crave victory. So, you know, again, what we see is the Americans riding in to save the day. The Americans and the British push the Italians and Germans out of North Africa. And then the Russians that are being beaten by the Germans and the Germans advance all the way to Stalingrad. Now here's um, one of the big questions is, did the Germans lure or the, did the Germans truly defeat the Russians all the way to Stalingrad or did the Russians lure the Germans to Stalingrad? Because the Battle of Stalingrad was one of the most violent, vicious battles of all time. The Germans lost 300,000 soldiers in Russia at the Battle of Stalingrad. That is almost all the Americans that were lost in World War II totally. Um, 1943 is where we see Russia, the Americans, and England becoming the ally force. Russia reclaims the Ukraine. The Americans started systematically destroying the Japanese naval structure, and Italy ousts Mussolini and surrenders to the Allies. They then turn around and declare war on Germany. In 1944, you have the landing in Normandy, which, uh, for those of you who've seen the Private Ryan movie, is what is seen in the first 20 minutes of that movie. Within three months, the Americans and British have landed two million men and a half a million vehicles. And shortly thereafter, we see the liberation of Paris. 1945, it's time to end it. The Soviets take over Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. The Allied troops push into Germany from the west. On April 28th, Mussolini is shot by the Italians. He's then hung upside down on the city walls. Um, April 30th, Hitler commits suicide. 
May 7th, one week later, Germany surrenders. In August, after it is realized that the Japanese are never going to surrender, President Truman orders the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then on August 14th, Japan surrenders. So, <clears throat> literally, in four months, the war ends very quickly. So, let's look at some of the um, social issues associated with the war. First, we have the death tolls. Um, Russia suffered an amazingly high number of deaths, 23 million. And this is military, military and civilian um, China, 15 million. Germany, almost 8 million. Japan, almost 3 million. Um, France, over a half a million. Great Britain, a half a million. And the U.S., 418,000. Still a huge number, especially when you compare that to the war in Iraq that went on for um, 10 years um, in the aughts, 2002 to 2000. Um, 13, 14, um, we lost 6,000 men. So, you know, enormous death tolls. Now, one of the big issues of World War II, and it's almost impossible to discuss World War II without addressing this, is the anti-Semitism um, that was pervasive in Germany. And um, essentially, the Nazi party blamed the Jews for the financial problems in Germany. Um, because in the Christian Bible and in the Islamic uh, holy book, loaning money for interest is considered to be a sin. The Jews became the religion that really managed the banking for most of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. Um, during the Renaissance, the Christians slowly started to take it over. But for a long time, the banking industry was in the exclusive domain of the Jews. And as such, there has always been this animosity towards them because they controlled money that people needed to improve their businesses, buy houses, and all this other stuff. And it's just like today. We all hate our banks. You know, the people who work in them are very nice, but we hate banks in general. In 1935, Germany had also passed the Nuremberg Laws, which I would definitely remember, which made Jewish people second-class citizens. In 1938, Jews were being resettled in camps. These were labor camps, um, all of their belongings seized by the Nazis. They were essentially turned into slaves, and um, they were slaves for such big companies as Volkswagen and Mercedes. So, you know, these are not companies that were unaware. They completely understood what they were doing. Beginning in 1941, the Nazis used mobile units that went into towns and killed Jews. They essentially lined up all the Jews against a ditch, shot them. They moved into the ditch. They covered them with dirt. They moved on to the next town. Now, this is actually called a holocaust. It's a systematic execution of non-Aryan people, especially the Jews. In 1942, the Germans decided it would be much more tr efficient to transport the Jews to a central location to kill them. So, six death camps were set up in Poland, and poison gas was used to exterminate the inhabitants, and then their remains were cremated. Um, this is what the Jews look like. They were essentially starved until they died, if they could work, if they were not um, potential slaves. They were just poisoned and then um, cremated as soon as they got to the camps. The rooms where they were killed were built to look like showers, so they were, they arrive at the camp, they were told they were getting a shower, their heads were shaved, and when they went into the shower, they were actually gassed to death. Um, in addition to the Jews, the Nazis went after the Gypsies, which were Hungarians, the Slavs, the Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, and homosexuals. They were assigned a specific badge to identify their designation. So, for example, homosexuals were identified with a pink um, triangle. If you were Jewish, you had a yellow star of David and so on and so forth. 
um, inhabitants who were fit enough to work were kept alive to be slave labor. And then when they got weak from hunger, um, they were essentially allowed to die or they were killed. Um, were they fed? Yes, but not much. They were given a bowl of potato soup once a day with some um, stale bread and that was it for them all day every day and there were people who lived for years subsisting on this they would eat roots out of the ground just to subs um, sustain them now the death toll of the holocaust is to this day one of the most staggering things that has ever been recorded in modern history six million jews three million soviet prisoners of war three million soviet and polish citizens one million Slavic citizens, about 70,000 men, women, and children with mental and physical handicaps, 200,000 gypsies, and the actual number of political prisoners, resistance fighters, and homosexuals is unknown. Um, but we do know that over 13 million people died in the Holocaust. It is absolutely one of the worst tragedies of the modern age. <clears throat> So as we end World War II, we are looking at a new war, a different kind of war. It's called the Cold War. And this existed between the U.S. and the Soviet Union because the U.S. had used the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Soviet Union was scrambling to create their own atomic bomb. And essentially what the Cold War was, was a Mexican standoff between the Soviet Union and the USA to see who would use the bomb first. And the idea here is that anyone who was going to use the bomb is going to be creating nuclear annihilation or mutually assured destruction. Um, and we'll be talking about this in more detail at the next lecture. If you have any questions, please text me or email me. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.